know my sheep and am known of mine. He knows his flock. He knows them personally. He knows how many have died and gone on to paradise. And he knows how many left that he's going to carry on to glory in the future. He knows that condition and that circumstances in which they live. He knows them personally, one by one. He knows all of, about you that can be known. Nothing is hidden from him. Join Bishop Arthur Embrasure and the Apostolic Church of God as we praise and worship the Lord together.
Let the church say, thank you, Jesus. Let the church say, praise the Lord. What a blessing it is to be back in the house of prayer. One more time. Lord, have mercy. What a blessing. God has smiled upon us, given us health and strength, so that one more time, every Sunday we sing that song. I'm glad to be in the service one more time. Now the time has come for us to go before the Lord in prayer. Let us call upon his holy name. Eternal God, our Father. Before we ask anything, we first give you thanks for your many blessings. We thank you because you have called us out of darkness and shed upon us your marvelous light. You opened our eyes to see the glorious salvation that is in Christ Jesus. And now, Father, we pray that you will bless this congregation, these families and their children, who have come from various parts of our city and the suburbs to come together in one place, in your church, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. Bless this congregation, O oh Lord. Bless these, your people, the sheep of your, of your pasture. We ask, O oh Lord, uh, that those who are in any trouble, we ask, O oh Lord, that you will deliver them from it. Those who are touched with any kind of affliction, bless them, O oh God, I pray. And we pray, O oh Lord, as we gather together in this one place, that you will bless the preacher, that the preached word of God will touch the hearts of these, your people, and strengthen them and encourage them. Yes. We pray, Lord, for souls who do not know Christ, who are here today searching for something better. We ask, oh Lord, that when this service is over and the doors of the church are open, that you would touch their hearts. They will come forward to receive Jesus Christ. And, oh Lord, hear our prayer and bless uh, President Stroger. Bless him, Lord. We ask it in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Today's scripture reading is taken from Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses four through eight. Let us all read together. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. And this is the word of the Lord. Lord Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus paid an awful price that you and I might have a right to the tree of life. It's his blood that cleanses us from our sins. Our congregational song, nothing but the blood.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of our God. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. Is the best thing I've ever, I've ever done. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in with Jesus is the best thing I've ever, I've ever done. In his arms I feel protected. In his arms never disconnected, no.
We. Mm-hmm. 
Peacock Choir because of your ministry to us this morning and especially in that last song. You've touched our hearts. And it just so happens that my subject is I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed. The Lord has been good to us. And as, as, I, and as I address this wonderful congregation this morning, I hope that the words that I, I say, I pray, I pray that the words that I say to you today will be a blessing to you. You come far and near to hear the word of God, not to see someone posturing or trying to be eloquent, using long words that nobody understands. But you come to hear what thus saith the Lord. And, and this position is, is awesome. And it's hard for me to even think of myself being in a position where People come to hear from me what thus saith the Lord. That calls for the greatest humility. The greatest humility. And I trust and pray that God will use me, his servant, to bless you. And I don't want to forget, and I certainly will be talking to you who are not saved, who have not received Christ in your life. My message is to you as well. I never forget you. There's never a sermon I preach you on Sunday morning that I do not remember that there are those who are here who have come searching for something better. And I hope that the Holy Spirit will touch you today because that's what it takes. It does not take eloquent speech. It takes the Holy Spirit to use those words and touch your heart. Now the devil, the devil is going to try to tell you, no, don't, get, don't come, don't go. Too many people, do, do go out, great big church. The pastor will never know who you are. That's the enemy. When Jesus was speaking, Jesus was speaking to huge crowds. Jesus didn't know everybody in the crowd, but the people knew him and they came to him. Jesus knows every single one of you. Not a, not a hair in your head can fall without the Lord knowing about it. Now, I want you to open your Bibles. And I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Ephesians. The book. As I say in my Bible class, once again, we open the book. The Bible, the word Bible comes from the Greek word biblos. The word biblos means book. And this is the book. And we are people of the book. We are people of the book. So I want you to open your Bible, open the book. Turn to the word of the Lord. Yes. Yes, Lord. Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm going to read verse 7. Speaking about Christ. In whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> These words, which we have just read, are only one of the many statements that comprise the first chapter 
of this magnificent letter to the saints at Ephesus. This letter is filled with so many spiritual gems that it has been called the treasury house of the Bible. This text that we have just read is almost a summary of the verses ahead. The apostle wrote these words so that we could take them to heart and not let the enemy confuse us in regards to our salvation. And when I speak of the enemy, I am speaking of the adversary. The accuser of the brethren. The enemy of our souls. The enemy of God. He goes by many names. The devil. Satan. The serpent. Apollyon. Beelzebub, Mephistopheles, but by whatever name he is called, it is he who seeks to cloud our spiritual vision and fill our minds with doubt. Many of you have had that problem. I know I have. I've been saved over 58 years, and I would be handling the truth lightly. If I did not tell you that there have been times in those 58 years that I have not been assailed with doubts of some kind. But God has always been there. So don't let doubts hinder you. Because if you are a human being, if you are a normal person, and Christianity is so filled with mystery that you are going to have some doubts and fears. But the Lord is always there to lift these doubts from us. They come back again in another form, but we're always left standing strong. And this letter gives us the good news that we have been redeemed by the blood of Christ according to the riches of his grace. And our redemption is based not upon our good works, but upon the pleasure of the Father's goodwill. The saints of God have been drinking from the fountain of Christ down through the years. And this fountain is just as full today as it was from the first day when the Lord spoke to the woman at the well and said, the water that I give you, if you take a drink, a drink, a drink, he said, if you continue to drink of the water from this well, you'll thirst again. If you, you keep on drinking and drinking and drinking. But if you take a drink, now I know that the King James Version doesn't say a drink, but in the original language, it is very clear that Jesus is saying that one drink from the well, the water that I give, you will never thirst again. This epistle we have before us tells us what the church is all about. The church is God's chosen people 
and we see how the sinner who was dead in sin is brought to a state of life. The sinner from lying in a spiritual grave to sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And not one particle of this was due to anything that the sinner has done. And it's all due to the riches of God's grace. The word grace, I speak about it often, I preach about it often. The word grace is constantly and was constantly on the minds of the Apostle Paul. In verse 6, he writes of the praise of the glory of his grace. In chapter 2, verse 5, he writes, by grace are you saved. In verse 7, he writes about the exceeding riches of his grace. And here in this text, we read about the forgiveness of sins according to his grace. And all of the letters that the apostle writes, he opens them up using that word, grace. This epistle is just filled, this epistle of Ephesians, is just filled with joy and exuberance. We read expressions like fullness and riches and, and abounding grace. How God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. Just think of that. Think of it. That's why I said there's a, such a mystery in Christ that God is able to do abundantly, far above everything that you can ask or think. This is what the church is all about. Yeah. Just now there's a place for folks to come and sit down and, yeah. and, and, and listen to some preacher. Preach. Hear the choir singing. Yeah. There's something different yeah. about the church. Yeah. At one time, the younger generation of my day gave the church a wide berth. The church was not very high on our list of priorities. For some, it was a place to be avoided. That was a great misunderstanding about what the church was all about. Perhaps we saw the church as a place where harmless discourses were delivered unrelated to reality. We viewed the church as a building with a distinctive architectural design where babies were blessed and funerals were preached and where soothing words were spoke to give those who needed comfort. Worse, Maybe we were fed up with an objectionable type of ministry where the pulpit was used as a soapbox from which the preacher could vent his spleen upon anyone who disagreed with him and all the taboos that the church gave, one taboo after another. Anything that a young person enjoyed was almost a sin. Made no difference what it was. I know when I was younger, playing checkers was a sin. Couldn't play checkers. Just pushing a checker around every night. They said, no, you can't play checkers. It was a hard thing for me to understand. Uh, my wife said one time to me, Sister Brady, she probably don't remember it. She said, let's play checkers. I said, oh, we can't play checkers. <laughs> she said, I don't mean the other checkers. I mean Chinese checkers. Do you remember that, Sister Brady? <laughs> we could play Chinese checkers. I don't know. But we couldn't play regular checkers. And it's kind of hard to understand. Couldn't go to the movies, couldn't go to the beach. Especially men, you go to the beach, you see women naked, they say it was naked, the women wasn't naked, they had on bathing suits. But they say you go there and you see all those women, you'd fall, you'd fall in the sand, you'd be lusting all over the place, so stay away from the beaches. And uh, these things sort of soured the mind. But something has changed. There's a new awareness stimulating this generation. I can feel it. As I look across this congregation, I can see it. And I am moved by it. 
Not only do I see it here in this church, but I see it elsewhere. I see a deeper appreciation for Jesus Christ and a more profound understanding of who he is. There's something of a paradox here. And I'm talking about young men and women in their 20s and 30s and 40s. This is the age group that fills our prisons. This is the age group that drives while drinking. This is the age group that is devastated by the scourge of drugs. But something else is happening, ladies and gentlemen. Something noble, something soul stirring, something that goes beyond mechanical rectitude and legal righteousness. Something elevating and stimulating is going on among young people today. They are coming out of hiding. They are coming out from hiding or behind the flimsy facade of, of strange hairdos and skin piercing and weird clothing. They are coming out from hiding behind the dismal world of, of dope and narcotics. They are, they are coming out from hiding from selfish, egotistical world of the me generation. They are coming out of hiding from confronting themselves and asking themselves the question, who am I? What am I doing? Where am I going? And coming out of hiding, they have rediscovered the church. And they have been made aware of the awesome power of the gospel. They have discovered that Christ is not that soulful eyed figure with soft flowing golden locks of hair so often portrayed on the walls of Christian bookstores. They have discovered that God is not some hazy, nebulous, dim figure often described as the man upstairs. On the contrary, they have discovered a God of might, a God of power, a God who created the world, a God created the universe. A God created the sea and all that is therein. A God that does everything according to the counsel of his own will and who cannot be manipulated by the selfish wants and desires of man. A God who is able to do all things. They have discovered that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. They have been enthralled by the marvelous news of the gospel. And over the years, Sunday after Sunday, I've seen God at work. I have watched young men and women in their 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s respond to the gospel. And I have heard their testimonies of deliverance, deliverance from drugs, deliverance from cigarettes, deliverance from vice and bad habits but not without struggle. There was no magic wand waved and all of these things miraculously disappeared. There was a struggle. We had a, 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 a lifestyle that we had to give up. It was not easy. I know what it means to be a cigarette smoker. Now, cigarette smoker is not going to send anybody to hell, but it's a terrible habit, and it's costing you more and more money every day because they're trying to tax cigarettes out of existence. But I smoke camel cigarettes, and I know what it, what it means. I'm not trying to de denounce people who smoke cigarettes. I'm just telling you it's a bad habit that you, and that you can't get rid of if you want to get rid of it. God is able, but you got to trust him. I know what it means to be a cigarette smoker. I know what it means to wake up in the morning. The first thing you look for is a cigarette. And if you didn't have any cigarettes, back in those days, we didn't have a whole lot of cigarettes. I, could never, I never bought a carton. I could, sometimes I couldn't even buy a pack. And back in those days, the drugstore opened them up and sold them uh, one cigarette for a penny. And I'd go and say, give me five cigarettes and put a nickel down and have five cigarettes in my pocket. And sometimes didn't have any. Now I would go to the ashtray and break up the butts. 
and get me a, a paper bag from the grocery store and tear it off and put those cigarettes that back in there and roll me one. <laughs> I know how to do it. But I can tell you now that they could drag off a cigarette made out of paper from a grocery store, you talking about something hot going down your throat. I've been there. But when God came into my life and filled me with the Holy Spirit, now let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I know some people, God came in and took the cigarette habit away just like that. But not me. I still had it. After I had the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, the Spirit of God gave us, I woke up still wanting that cigarette. I wanted one bad. I wanted one so bad. And I, after I ate, I wanted one. Every time I got nervous, I wanted a cigarette. But for the day that God filled me with the Holy Ghost, I never put another cigarette to my lips. Although, although I carried them around in my pocket. I carried them around in my pocket. I take out a cigarette butt, because back in those days, you know, you, 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 you choked them. <laughs> Some of y'all got a lot of money, you don't know nothing about that. You smoke a cigarette, have you throw it away, but back in those days, half cigarette, we choked and put it in our pocket. <laughs> I pulled out that cigarette butt and looked at it and put it back in my pocket. I was working in Western Electric at that time, and I, you couldn't smoke at the, at, the, at the table, at the bench, but I go to the washroom. And I pulled that cigarette out to smoke it. I looked at it, put it back, went back to the bench. I did that for weeks. And finally, in the, in the washroom at Western Electric, at 55th and Arch at that time, I went to the washroom, pulled out the cigarette butt, and something said in my mind, you got to throw it away one day. Why not now? I dropped it on the ground. As long as I had them around, I was always having trouble. But when I got rid of the cigarette butts, got rid of all the cigarettes, God delivered me from that, and I've been delivered now for over 57 years. And it was delivered not with any help from the, the things you got today. You, there are all kinds of things, pads and gum and, and things you can put on your, on your skin. Cold turkey. That's what God did. He can do it for you. And cigarettes is a small thing. There are other people who have, who have narcotics. I never had that problem. But I've known people who did. And I've seen them come and God delivered some right away. And I've seen some come and stumble and fall back and then come back again and then stumble and fall back and then come back again and then stumble and fall back and come back. Oh, glory. But God in the final analysis, brought him out. And now this is saying, Bishop, I've been clean for five years. I've been clean for 10 years. I've been clean, clean, clean. God is a clean, he, he can redeem you. I have been redeemed, you have been redeemed, and God is able to do everything for you if you will surrender to him. Yes, it's a struggle. But you do, not, you do not have a passive God sitting around waiting for you to fall and, and then drop, drop judgment on you. We've got an active God pursuing you and keeping you and giving you strength. Just like God delivered Israel, he delivered you. God kept them in the wilderness. He fed them for 40 years with manna from on high. He gave them water to drink out in the desert. Their clothes on their back never grew old. And the shoes on their feet never wore out. God is with us today. And he will give you everything that you need to walk with him. And to know Christ is to know about him, is to know what he is, who he is, and what he does. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and am known of mine. He knows his flock. 
He knows them personally. He knows how many have died and gone on to paradise. And he knows how many left that he's going to carry on to glory in the future. He knows that condition and that circumstances in which they live. He knows them personally, one by one. He knows all about you that can be known. Nothing is hidden from him. He knows their sins and forgives them. He knows their diseases and heals them. He knows their needs and supplies them. He knows their fears and eases them. He knows their weaknesses and strengthens them. He knows their wanderings and he recovers them. He knows their prayers and he answers them. Somebody say, oh, that's a big church. The pastor don't know you. God knows who you are. And I know more than some of you think I know. And so, my brothers and sisters, let us not fear. Let us not be afraid of the perils of the future. For the Lord will not suffer one half of your head to perish. No temptation will come upon you that you're not able to bear. In other words, he's saying that there's no temptation that will drive you and take you away from Christ. Somebody said, well, sometimes Christians backslide. Yes, they do. I would be remiss if I said Christians don't backslide. But they never, if, I'm talking about a true Christian. Yes, sir. They never backslide out of the will of God. That's right. Out of his arm. God will always bring them back. Yes, always. He'll always bring them back. Many of us ministers, ministers experienced it. We know it. Yes. I remember Bishop Carl Smith. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. I remember him telling me of one of his ministers, one of his, one of his members, wonderful man, backslid, and was gone 15 years. So that man came back to the Lord. And shortly after he came back to the Lord, he died. And Bishop Carl Smith said, Elder Brazier, I was an elder then, he said, Elder Brazier, always remember this, that if you ever once been saved and backslid, before you die, the Lord will bring you back. Now, when Bishop Carl Smith said that to me, I didn't, I didn't believe in eternal security, because we were taught against that. And I said in my mind, I said, that sounds like eternal security to me. When I mentioned that to some of my brothers, they said, oh, no, Bishop Smith didn't say that because we said unto him, we know what he believed. I don't know what he taught. I don't know, I don't know what he taught. But I ran a revival for him in his house. I stayed in his home. And I know what he said to me in his living room. What he taught other folks, I don't know. But he said, if you've ever been really saved, before you die, the Lord will bring you back. No temptation can come upon you that you would not be able to bear. No trouble can come that God does not permit it to come. And no trial can come that God cannot overrule and make it work for your good. One writer said, fear knocked at the door. Faith answered. And there was no one there. And so, ladies and gentlemen, with this faith, fear will be driven out. With this faith, every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. With this faith, we can emerge from the dark chambers of pessimism and emerge into the light of enthusiasm and hope. With this faith, we can take the wings of the morning and rise from the abyss of gloom and soar among the mountain peaks of optimism and courage. With this faith, we can walk with Christ in a world that's denouncing him, in a world that's lying on him, in a world where people, by the millions, are buying the book called the Da Vinci Code that says that Jesus married Mary Magdalene and had children. Lies! Works of the enemy. With this faith, you can be an overcomer. Is there someone here this morning who would like to come and give themselves to Christ? 
rise from your seat this morning and come forward. Whoever you are and wherever you are. There's someone coming from the balcony. There's someone coming down the aisle there. As our choir sings, we're waiting for you. God bless you, my brother. Are you in the Kenwood Sanctuary? There's someone there to receive you and bring you over here. Are you in the balcony? You're not too far away. something urging you to get up and come forward tell the devil Satan get behind me I'm going give my life to Christ that you have enjoyed Dr. Brazier and this Saving Grace broadcast coming from the Apostolic Church of God in Chicago. We hope that you have been blessed and we invite you to visit us in the near future here in this beautiful edifice at 6320 South Dorchester in Chicago, Illinois.